Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 113, A Coda, The Life of Augustine Phillips, Player. The name of Augustine Phillips was one that popped up occasionally as I researched the players of the Elizabethan period in England, but somehow mention of him never made it to the final cut. So, as a coda to the season, I've pulled together these facts and stories and put them into a sketch of his life. The story of the Elizabethan players tends to be dominated by Kemp and Burbage and Allen, but they were so big in their time that they hardly count as typical examples. There is a second tier of actors, the tier that Phillips, Condell, Hemmings and Shakespeare fall into. They were still very successful, hardly what we might think of as normal people, but they weren't the star players and, as far as we can tell, always had to operate in the shadow of the greats. So their lives give us a glimpse into something slightly more ordinary, but still heavily involved with the theatre. Through some very ordinary records, some more extraordinary ones, and the preservation of his will and its aftermath, we have a potted history of the life of Augustine Phillips, which, I think, gives us a good feel for something of the life of the player in Elizabethan London. Everything that comes next is based on factual records, with the absolute minimum of the speculation that I usually allow myself. So, for the next few minutes, please let yourself become immersed in the life of Augustine Phillips, player. We know nothing of his birth or family, and he first appears in the historic record as a fully formed player. This is in a plot sheet for the play The Second Part of the Seven Deadly Sins which may be the play written by the early court comic Richard Tarleton. The plot sheet has been preserved among the Henslow papers at Dulwich College, but the play itself is lost. However, it has been reasonably dated to about 1590 and was probably played by Lord Strang's men. As you know, a plot sheet gives the clues for the entrances and exits of the characters and the players. For example, one of the entries in this case reads... Enter Sardanapius, Arabactus, Nicanor and Captains, marching. Mr Phillips, Mr Pope, Robert Pallant, Kit, John Sinclair, John Holland. Sardanapius was a known historical figure through Greek accounts of the late Assyrian Empire, where it was said he was the last king, although this in fact is not historically correct. That part in the play must have been a big one, as Phillips is one of the few actors who did not have to double up on parts for the production. That might also suggest that he held a senior position amongst the players in the troupe. Jump forward a few years, to May 1593, and to a London in the grip of the plague. Lord Strang's men appealed to the Privy Council for permission to travel out of the city, something that was tightly controlled during the times when the sickness was rife. The council responded favourably, and perhaps it helped the player's case that the sympathetic Lord High Admiral, he of the Admiral's men, was present at the meeting. Augustine is mentioned as one of the six players permitted to travel. Whereas it was thought meet that during the time of the infection and continuance of the sickness in the City of London, there should be no plays or interlude be used, for the avoidance of the assemblies and the concourse of people in any usual place appointed near the said city. And therefore, the bearer thereof, Edward Allen, servant of the Right Honourable the Lord High Admiral, William Kemp, Thomas Pope, John Hemmings, Augustine Phillips and George Brain, being of one company, servants to the very good Lord, the Lord Strange, are restrained their exercise of playing within the said city, and liberties thereof. Yet it is not thereby meant, but that they shall and may, in regard of the service done by them, and to be done at the court, exercise their quality of playing, comedies, tragedies, and the such like, in any cities, towns, and corporations, where the infection is not. So it be not within seven miles of London, or of the court. That they may be in the better readiness hereinafter for Her Majesty's service, whensoever they shall be thereunto called. These, therefore, shall be to will and require you that they may, without their let or consideration, use their said exercises at their most convenient times and places, the accustomed times of divine prayer accepted. 
We notice there that the excuse for the permission is that their skills remained honed so that they may be ready to entertain the Queen when normality is restored. Shorty added to ensure that any local Jobsworth who thought he could stop the players performing was reminded of who was ultimately going to benefit from this permission. When looking at the minutiae of a life, the records often come down to taxation. And this is also true for Augustine, who in 1593 was assessed by the subsidy commissioners. His worth was considered to be £3, and he was taxed 8 shillings. The tax was related to his place of living, which is shown to be in the Liberty of the Clink. That name comes from the nickname for the jail in the area of where he was living, which was the part of Southwark that we now know as Bankside, so just outside the city on the opposite bank of the River Thames and close to the heart of Theatreland of the day. One year later, that record is enhanced by mention of Augustine and his family of three living in Horseshoe Court, near Bullshead Alley, again in The Liberty of the Clink. Records also show that his first daughter was baptised on the 29th of September 1594, Magdalene was the given name, and her father is recorded as Histrionus, meaning player. Changes came when Fernando Stanley, Lord Strang, died in April 1594. Phillips joined the Lord Chamberlain's men and was to remain with them through all their iterations until his death. The family continued to live in Horseshoe Court and in 1596 another daughter, Rebecca, was baptised. In this case, her father is listed as Player of Interludes. At some point in the winter of 1596 and 1597, the family left that residence and the next reference to them is in the parish register of the Church of St. Botolph's without Aldgate, which was at the eastern end of the city. Perhaps a better part of the city for a family home, not so convenient for the theatres, but away from the rough characters and living associated with Southwark. Sadly, that record relates to a stillborn child and is horribly practical. A woman child, daughter to Augustine Phillips, a player of interludes, dwelling in Mr Hammond's rents, being amongst the gardens near Houndsditch, was buried on the 7th day of September, anno 1597, being stillborn, three shillings, for the pit and the knell, 18 pence. That last reference being for the digging of the grave and the tolling of the bell. A further record in the parish register shows Anne going through the churching ceremony on the 5th of October. The ritual, usually held to give thanks for the safe delivery and survival of the mother, must have been very sombre on this occasion. But these personal troubles didn't put a stop to Augustine's career on stage. In 1598, the records of the Master of the Revels include his name amongst those of the Lord Chamberlain's men as they gave the first performance of Ben Jonson's Every Man in His Humour. The players listed are William Shakespeare, Richard Burbage, Augustine Phillips, John Hemmings, Henry Condell, Thomas Pope, William Sly, Christopher Beeston, Will Kemp and John Duke. The following year, the same company without Shakespeare are recorded as performing Johnson's Every Man Out of His Humour. During that year, 1599, Anne was pregnant again and this time successfully delivered a third daughter in August. This is recorded in the parish register of St Stephen's Church, Coleman Street, which suggests that the family had moved again, but there are no other records to support this. In 1601, the players became embroiled in a political rebellion by the Earl of Essex. Essex was a distant cousin of the Queen and had spent his life at court and in the army. Although he was at times a favourite of the Queen and popular with the ordinary people, he made many enemies at court with his brash and at times disrespectful behaviour. It was said that on one occasion he was so forthright in his speech to the Queen that she slapped him across the face and in response he half drew his sword. He was certainly lucky to have survived such an incident with his life, but he didn't learn and continued his brash and bad behaviour. In the military he served against Spain with distinction, but then led an inconclusive mission to Ireland. 
His command was seen to be at fault as he dithered his way around the country without decisive engagements and wasted the funds and the men provided. On his return to London, which had not been sanctioned by the Queen, he had to face a trial for his behaviour and a failure to bring the Irish to heel. Again, his life was spared, but his movements and many of his monopoly concessions that had been granted to him and were his main source of income were removed from his control. As he became steadily more disgruntled with the Queen and her supporters, he planned a coup, gathering his own supporters and weapons in his house on the Strand in London, close to Westminster. On the 7th of February, some of his supporters went to the Globe and asked the players for a special performance of Shakespeare's Richard II. There was nothing unusual in the representatives of a high member of the court asking for a special performance, but the players were aware that the choice was controversial, as the play included scenes relating to a monarch being deposed. Their agreement to play was secured, but at a greatly increased fee. Some additional 40 shillings, something like £500 in today's terms, was added to their usual fee. As things turned out, events were getting ahead of Essex. The same day, the Privy Council called on him to attend them, and he refused, making the Council fully aware of the seriousness of the situation. Having lost any element of surprise, Essex knew that he had to move quickly. The next morning, messengers from the Queen were taken hostage and he marched with about 200 men into the city, expecting many of the population to join him. The Privy Council got word to the Lord Mayor declaring Essex a traitor, a word that had some very serious implications for anybody who was in any way connected with the instigator. As the word spread, the expected crowd failed to appear and many of his supporters melted away before they could be recognised. Essex and his remaining men returned to Essex House, found their hostages to be gone, and were soon under siege by men loyal to the Queen. By evening, Essex and his remaining followers were under arrest. Essex and the ringleaders were all tried for treason and beheaded two weeks later. In the days following that attempted coup in what must have been a very freebile atmosphere in London, the Privy Council took to examining all of those who might have been involved. Phillips was examined by two justices appointed by the council for that task. They wrote up the examination for the official record. The examination of Augustine Phillips, servant unto the Lord Chamberlain and one of his players, taken on the 18th of February 1601 under oath. That Friday last, or Thursday, Sir Charles Percy, Sir Jocelyn Percy and the Lord Mount Eagle, with some three more, spoke to some of the players in the presence of this examinate, to have the play of the deposing and the killing of King Richard II to be played on Saturday next, promising them 40 shillings more than their ordinary to play it. Where this examinate and his fellows were determined to have played some other play, holding that the play of King Richard to be so old and so long out of use that they should have small or no company at it. But at their request, this examinate and his fellows were content to play it on the Saturday and had their 40 shillings more than their ordinary for it, and so played it accordingly. At the time, Richard II was about six years old, which Philip suggests made it very old and of little interest. Perhaps he was just trying to stress that the choice for this particular play was not the choice of the players. The fact that Phillips was called on to testify, and not Shakespeare, the author of the play, or Burbage, the lead actor, might indicate that Phillips had some role in the management of the Globe. His testimony seems to focus on the money paid for the performance, so perhaps he was seen as a representative who could talk to the finances of the theatre. Whatever the case, his testimony seems to have convinced the council that the player's involvement was innocent, and no further action was taken. In fact, the Lord Chamberlain's men performed for the Queen later that month, the night before Essex and his co-conspirators were executed. The Phillips family continued to expand with the birth of a son, Austin, in November 1601, and in February 1603, Augustine's sister Elizabeth was married to a fellow player, Robert Goff. Elizabeth is named as a beneficiary in Augustine's will, and Robert acted as witness to it. In late 1602, the family were back living in their former home in Horseshoe Alley. 
The reasons for the move back are not known, but the record shows a family of six, the couple, their son and three daughters. The family remained there for the next couple of years. On the 17th of May 1603, King James formally created the King's Men and named Augustine Phillips as one of them, along with Lawrence Fletcher, William Shakespeare, Richard Burbage, John Hemmings, Henry Condell, William Sly, Robert Armin and Richard Cowley. As the King's licensed players, they naturally took part in the King's delayed coronation ceremony in March 1604. Their names are listed in the court books of account and it mentions that each player received four and a half yards of red cloth for their livery. But as the players were riding high from the King's benefit, personal tragedy struck again when Austin Phillips, Augustine's and Anne's only son, died and was buried on the 1st of July 1604. He was just three and a half years old. And that same year, we see Phillips in a different guise, that of a moneylender. As you've already heard, this was not an uncommon practice for men with money, and suggests that by now, Phillips was a man of some means. In November 1604, he lent £100 to John Baumfield. The loan was for a period of six months at the allowed interest rate of 10%, so Phillips was to be repaid £105. Phillips died just before that debt was to become due, and as part of his executor duties, John Hemmings confirmed to the probate court that the debt had been settled. Augustine Phillips made his will in early May 1605. He died a few days later. In the name of God, Amen. The fourth day of May, Anno Domini, 1605. I, Augustine Phillips of Mortlake in the county of Surrey, gentlemen, being at this present sick and weak in body, but of good and perfect mind and remembrance, thanks be unto Almighty God, do make, ordain and dispose this, my present testament and last will, in manner and form the following. That is to say, first and principally, I commend my soul unto the hands of Almighty God, and I commit my body to be buried in the chancel of the parish church of Mortlake aforesaid. And after my body buried and the funeral charges paid, then I will that all such debts and duties as I owe to any person shall be truly paid, and that my goods, chattels, plate, household stuff, jewels, ready money and debts shall be divided by my executrix into three equal and indifferent parts and portions, where, of the one part, I give and bequeath to Anne Phillips, my loving wife, to her own proper use and behoof. One other part thereunto amongst my three daughters, Magdalene Phillips, Rebecca Phillips and Anne Phillips, equally amongst them, to be divided, portioned and portion-like, and to be paid and delivered unto them, as they and every of them shall accomplish and come to their lawful ages of twenty and one years, or at the dates of their marriage. And the other part thereof I reserved to myself and to my executrix to perform my legacies hereinafter following. Item. I give and bequeath to the poor of the parish of Mortlake aforesaid five pounds. Item. I give and bequeath to Agnes Bennett, my loving mother, during her natural life every year yearly the sum of five pounds. Item. I give to my brothers, William Webb and James Webb, if they shall be living at my decease, to either of them the sum of ten pounds. Item. I give and bequeath to my sister, Elizabeth Goff, the sum of ten pounds. Item. I will and bequeath unto Miles Bourne and Philip Bourne, two sons of my sister, to either of them ten pounds. Item. I give and bequeath unto and amongst the hired men of the company which I am of, which shall be at the time of my decease, the sum of five pounds to be equally distributed amongst them. Item. I give and bequeath unto my fellow, William Shakespeare, a thirty shilling piece in gold. To my fellow, Henry Condell, one other thirty shilling piece in gold. To my servant, Christopher Beeston, thirty shillings in gold. To my fellow Lawrence Fletcher, 20 shillings in gold. To my fellow Robert Armin, 20 shillings in gold. To my fellow Richard Cowley, 
20 shillings in gold. To my fellow Alexander Cook, 20 shillings in gold. To my fellow Nicholas Toodley, 20 shillings in gold. I give to Samuel Gilburn, my late apprentice, the sum of 40 shillings and my mouse-coloured velvet hose and the white taffeta doublet, a black taffeta suit, my purple cloak, sword and dagger and my base vial. Item. I give to James Sands, my apprentice, the sum of 40 shillings and a sittern and a bandor and a lute to be paid and delivered unto him at the expiration of his term of years in his indenture of apprenticehood. Item. My will is that Elizabeth Phillips, my youngest daughter, shall have my house and lands in Mortlake. And I ordain and make the said Anne Phillips, my loving wife, sole executrix of this, my present testament and last will provided always that, if the said Anne my wife do at any time marry after my decease, that then, and from thenceforth, she shall cease to be any more or longer executrix of this my last will, or anyways intermeddle with the same, and the said Anne will have no part or portion of my goods or chattels to me or my executrix reserved, or appointed by this my last will and testament. And that then, and from thenceforth, John Hemmings, Richard Burbage, William Sly and Timothy Whithorn shall be fully and wholly my executors of this my last will and testament, as though the said Anne had never been named. And of the execution of this my present testament and last will, I ordain and make the said John Hemmings and Richard Burbage, William Sly and Timothy Whithorn overseers of this my present testament and last will. And I bequeath to the said John Richard Burbage and William Sly, or either of them, my said overseers, for their pains herein to be taken, a bowl of silver to the value of five pounds apiece. In witness whereof, from this my present testament and last will, I, the said Augustine Phillips, have put my hand and seal this day and year above written. Sealed and delivered by the said Augustine Phillips as his last will and testament in the presence of us, Robert Goff and William Shepherd. The mention of the instruments there is particularly interesting. Clearly he was a musician and these were very important instruments for those who could use them, enough to be specially mentioned in a will. The bass viol was a stringed instrument played with a bow. It looks a bit like a violin or cello, but it's not really part of the violin family. The sitan and the bandor were stringed instruments with a long neck, but were plucked rather than bowed. The lute is probably more familiar to you, but it is a shorter, round-bodied version of the bandor. Also in the will we learn that Augustine was now resident in Mortlake, which is situated southwest of London on the Thames, near Richmond. At the time, Mortlake would have been about a day's travel from London and very much the site of a country home, again indicating that Phillips had acquired quite some wealth and had this home as well as his London residence. On the 13th, probate was granted to his wife Anne as executrix for the will. Following Augustine's death, his family moved out of Horseshoe Alley and were replaced there by William Bird, also known as William Bourne, which may be the stage player of that name, who was married to Marjorie, another of Augustine's sisters. But that isn't quite the end of the story. Almost exactly two years later, the will was again presented to the probate office. Anne had remarried to one John Witter, so her position as executor became invalid. John Hemmings, with the others mentioned in the will, were sworn in as co-executors. Anne died in January 1618, and 15 months later John Witter raised a complaint with the Court of Requests against Hemmings and Condell as the executors for Augustine's will. The complaint includes some history to explain the situation. Phillips, we hear, owned a one-sixth share in the Globe, which passed to Anne on his death, and she in turn assigned these rights to Witter. Being in need of money, Witter then approached Hemmings with a view to securing a loan against his share of the Globe. The sum of £50 plus interest and an arrangement fee was agreed on, the total repayment due being £52 and 10 shillings. Since then, Witter claimed, Hemmings and Condell had retained the profits from that share and illegally denied him his due shares. 
Hemmings and Condell replied to the charges, agreeing that Phillips did indeed own one-sixth share of the globe, and that that share did pass to Anne by virtue of his will, but that the will also states that she should be removed from it when she remarried. They continued, This defendant, John Hemmings, further saith that the said complainant did come to this defendant and, making show and affirming that the said Anne and himself, that stood in great need of money, did make offer to procure the said Anne to mortgage her said part of the said playhouse, galleries, gardens and grounds, unto the defendant, for the sum of fifty pounds or thereabouts, wherewith to relieve their wants, and would have had the said and by herself to have made the said mortgage, but this defendant, suspecting that Witter and Anne might then be secretly married, and so her assurance alone nothing worth, and suspecting that the said Anne had already assigned over the said part of the said globe to the complainant, this defendant required the complainant to join in the said assurance of the said part of the said globe in the mortgage for his said money, which he yielded unto. And thereupon both he and the said Anne, the confessing themselves to be married, joined in the said mortgage to the defendant, and he paid unto them the sum of fifty pounds, which together with fifty shillings for consideration of the forbearance thereof, this defendant confesseth, was repaid unto him on the day limited in and by the said deed of assurance in mortgage for the repayment thereof. The response goes further, saying that Hemmings believed the terms of the will to be broken by the fact of Anne's remarriage, and that he particularly wanted to prevent Witter accessing £300 that was part of Anne's legacy, lest he should spend the same as he had before lavishly and riotously spent, wasted and consumed almost all the rest of the said goods and chattels, which were of the said Augustine Phillips. So with the consent and entreaty of the said Anne, the administration of the goods and chattels of the said Augustine Phillips was committed to this defendant as executor for the said will and testament of the said Augustine Phillips. And Hemmings then went even further, averring that he had also from time to time, diverse and many times in charity, and to relieve the said complainant, his said wife and her children, delivered sometimes unto the said complainant himself, sometimes to the said wife, and sometimes to others for them, diverse other sums of money, accounting to a further great sum of money, until about the said time of the burning of the playhouse. And then the said complainant, diverse years before the said Anne died, did suffer her to make shift for himself to live. And at her death, this defendant, out of charity, was at the charges of the burying of her. Witter's response the following May argued that the condition of the will that removed Anne from it was not applicable in English law, and that, even if it were, she had assigned her share of the globe to him before they were married. Perhaps this was disproved in documents that we do not have, but whatever the case, this is where the action died. In November 1620, so 18 months after Witter's response, the court removed the case from the rolls, saying that Witter was out of time to make any further representations, and that he should be liable to pay the defendants 20 shillings for their costs that had been wrongfully sustained. On a happier final memory of Augustine Phillips, in his 1612 An Apology for Actors, Thomas Hayward listed him amongst the greats that he remembered, saying, All the right I can do then is but this, that though they may be dead, their deserts yet live in the remembrance of many. <laughs>